Good morning, Martin, and good morning, everybody. We'll be talking about taking European companies global, and we're going to do it with a twist. Whereas normally people talk about taking the commercial organization global, this time around we're going to speak to Martin, who's the CTO at Salonis, about taking an engineering and product organization global. But let's start from the beginning. So, Martin, can you explain a little bit what Salonis does, just to set the context? Yeah, sure. Uh, good morning also from my side. Um, so we at Salonis, we're developing technology, like largely data processing uh, technology, um, which uh, we're delivering as a software as a service solution to customers. And I mean, the important question is like, what do you actually do with that technology? So um, what we enable customers to do is to put like a process management, process mining, process observability and automation layer on top of their business processes. That's a little bit abstract, so they, you take an ERP system, inside of the ERP system you're running your purchasing, you're running your order management, and so on and so forth. You put Salonis on top and then you can exercise much better control uh, over what's actually happening inside of your business. Yeah. I, sometimes I, I explain it as, it's like waving an x-ray over, over a company and then seeing what kind of processes the company follows and then giving recommendations and actually actions yeah. to automate some of those processes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, Martin, Salonis was started in Munich. Um, how did you build the product organization and the engineering organization in the early days? Yeah, so so um, it was mentioned like also at the beginning. So we ran the company in a in a bootstrap fashion for the first five years, um, and this is also how we built the organization. So we grew the organization very organically. We brought in people. We grew talent internally. Um, very tight knit uh, organization. But uh, then as the company grew, um, we had to bring certain levels of structure to the organization, like just to make sure that we're able to manage. So I think this is kind of similar to what, what most companies at that stage uh, would experience is uh, what, what we did um, is like taking the key leaders from the organization, turning them into managers, broadening the organization and um, being bootstrapped, like you, using opportunistically uh, uh, ways to just get people interested uh, in Salonis um, because, uh, I mean, as most of you probably know, it's very hard to hire good engineers. So we had a lot of homegrown talent um, um, who were building the product and the platform uh, in these it, days. It's already problematic in a way, right? Because you take your best engineers, yeah. you're going to say, don't build product anymore, now become a manager. Yeah. And then sometimes it turns out that these great engineers aren't actually the, the best managers. Yeah, so, yeah. So, so how did you and deal with that? So, so that, was a, that was a big challenge because the people who knew the software the best, who knew the code the best, uh, were also the people who kind of had the natural leadership uh, skills. Um, but I think what we, what we saw is that, and we learned that uh, also uh, along the way, is that like leadership and management is not the same is not the same thing and we have to be careful that we putting people into the position where they can ex exercise leadership the best way and for technical leaders that might be an individual contributor role uh, where it's also a lot more fun for for them so um, like I, I'm personally I'm an engineer and uh, what I always say is like I love solving te technical problems I don't love so much solving people problems or working uh, on, on, these, on these management uh, topics. So um, I think it's like back in, back in the days, it was the natural thing to do. Um, also because we, um, we didn't have a brand yet. We, um, we had like also in Munich, like fierce competition in the market. So there were not a lot of other options, uh, what we could actually do. Um, but it has been like one thing uh, as the organization scaled up, uh, we consciously did was seeing that like we create IC tracks, we, we make IC successful, we allow people to step from management roles back into IC roles uh, to make sure that our most valuable engineers um, can actually work on engineering and in driving the product yeah. forward. Yeah. 
So it, it, it's not unusual in the sense that many organizations have a, a management track and an individual yeah. contributor track, track, and you can get rewarded on both tracks. You don't necessarily have to become a manager yeah. in order to get paid more or, yeah. or to have more influence in the organization. I, I think a twist of that is, like, as an, as an engineer, sometimes we're like, okay, we can build everything and we can self-organize and so on and so forth. But, like, the, the, the flip side of that is that um, as the organization grows and, and is becoming uh, bigger and, and then also becoming distributed, is that um, you need good management as well. So you don't just need good engineers, but you also need good management because you have to establish processes, you have to establish um, an accountability structure, uh, you have to make sure that people work on the most important stuff for the company and not just the, the things which they are like most excited about. So um, I think both is like very important. Um, I think uh, from, from what I have learned is that like management is something which is easier to import into the company. Um, engineering culture and engineering skills and context of the technology and so on and so forth is something which is much harder to bring in uh, externally into the, into, the, um, into the company. Correct. Um, d d d just to set a bit of context, so Solonas now has 3,000 employees, yeah. 650 in product and engineering, so it's a sizable organization. Yeah. Um, w when you start to grow your organization in Munich, you, you, you mentioned earlier in the day that you actually were competing for engineers with, with a number of incumbents, right? Yeah. How did it go? Um, so, like in, in Munich, uh, over the last years, like a lot of like large, also U.S. companies uh, uh, established a presence, uh, and especially for for engineers, like there was a pretty fierce competition. So there's Google, there is uh, Amazon, uh, there is Microsoft, um, and like these companies also, at least to some extent, imported. Uh, Silicon Valley uh, salary bands uh, to Munich, which is quite difficult for a for a bootstrap company to match. Um, and so, yeah, we just had to be creative. Um, we were like forced to like foster and home grow our talent. Um, um, but we like at the same time we had to build um, a, a brand and, and trust in the community. Um, for, for being able to attract um, like high profile engineers and, and people with more experience because I think one thing one thing which i 've learned um, um, over the years is like when you want to attract um, senior engineers uh, who are interested in building like an individual contributor career or who have like very special skills uh, in a certain domain which you uh, which you need then um, you have to take the position of them, so, so why would they want to join uh, your company? And uh, especially for these engineering careers, I think big companies, uh, big tech companies, um, provide a very, let's say, relatively low risk path uh, of, of building such a career, and uh, they have people in technical roles uh, who people want to work with. And for us, being a, being a company with like homegrown talent, like no kind of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, prominent profiles uh, per se in the company, um, that was one factor which was pretty hard for us to overcome, uh, to actually attract people because they, they want to work with people who have a track record. Um, exactly. It's similar, I yeah. guess, for, for you on the investor side. Yeah. For you, like working with serial entrepreneurs is also... Uh, sometimes simpler than putting a bet on a company like Salonis with like exactly. these three guys who um, don't have a clue about what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it turned out that so, you did have a clue. But it, yeah, yeah. Well, in hindsight, so, yeah. right? So, so Salonis services and, and has as customers like 20% of the global 2000, yeah. uh, about half a billion in, in revenue. So the company ended up going global commercially, but why did you decide to also take the engineering organization 
global. Be because you didn't necessarily have to, right? You, you could yeah. have tried to kind of just keep it all in one place in Germany. Yeah. I mean, I think the great thing about software uh, is that um, like you don't have to ship any physical goods. You don't have to like go local for production or something. So per se, I think uh, taking a SaaS global uh, from a technical standpoint basically means like you might want to deploy to some other data centers or uh, um, uh, yeah, getting closer there. But for us, so we're working uh, with like very large corporations. We're working with uh, regulated industries as well. Um, and so the initial um, um, push why we went to the US um, was because some of these companies, they have like guidelines or, or policies that uh, part of the system uh, has to be operated by US people on US soil. Um, so that was basically uh, driven by the business um, that we have to build some kind of platform engineering presence um, because one of the things we're doing is we're operating a pretty large scale distributed uh, data infrastructure um, for our customers. Um, so, so that was the that was the one side. So, so um, I think in general, like if you decide to introduce a certain additional level of complexity into your organization, and internationalization is definitely it's a big um, it's a big step in terms of adding complexity because of the time zone difference, because of the cultural differences, and so on and so forth. You you have to do that like very purposefully. So you have to know why you're doing it. And uh, for us. Uh, supporting the business was was one key reason. Uh, the second one is that, like when we started, um, uh, Salonis uh, like cloud and uh, uh, cloud infrastructure wasn't really a thing which these customers uh, or our customer groups would uh, accept as a as an operating model. So so initially, Salonis was a was like an on-prem uh, product which you went out and deployed to your customer. And we did a uh, very big transformation where we um, uh, yeah, essentially redeveloped a large part of the stack, um, uh, built a cloud-native platform. Um, but that also introduces a lot of additional duties because like now it's you operating the service it's you not like just shipping an installer or a software package um, to customers and they run it but like it's software as a service um, so 24 hours 24 hours yeah it's a lot of additional processes in terms of what you have to do um, in terms of certifications and and so on and so forth so um, the the fact that we had to internationalize our business because the U.S. is the biggest software market in the world, um, combined with us like offering a software as a service solution, combined with the additional certifications, um, in the end, um, like plus um, the access to a bigger talent pool, um, were I think the main reasons for us for thinking about going international yeah. or al almost forcing us to go international. Yeah. So, so if you have a a whole team of people on the west coast in the US. Yeah. You have a team in Madrid, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And a team in Kosovo. Yes. Amongst others. Yeah. yeah. And, a, and one in Prague. One in Prague as well, oh. of course, yes. So tell me how things changed when, when suddenly you were recruiting engineers in Silicon Valley and managers in Silicon Valley. Um, th th there must have been a certain kind of culture clash between the new people coming on board from the outside yeah. and the existing people who, have, who had grown with Salonis over a number of years. How did you manage to integrate those two different kind of groups of people? Yeah, it, that, that's a, uh, that was probably the most difficult challenge which we had when, when, when scaling was that it's, it's like onboarding people to code and so on and so forth. Like this is all doable, but making sure that uh, we're like also able to establish the culture or to export the culture, which I think makes our company unique, um, is uh, has been has been quite challenging, especially as we did this like during uh, also during the Corona phase, where it was just very hard to travel and uh, and so on. Um, so um, yeah, the, there was like a lot of 
So when we hire people in Silicon Valley, for example, the, there's like relatively high salaries uh, compared to the current workforce. There is like a question of how do you distribute projects? How do you um, how do you kind of do you take new projects? Do you cut projects in half or, or products in half? How do you distribute the um, the, the responsibilities? Um, and what we I think did relatively well is start with uh, kind of uh, keep like bring in a few key people, uh, experienced people, people who you can build trust with, and people who have a network uh, in these uh, uh, like in these regions, for example, in Silicon Valley, um, and then first like get them on board, um, build a relationship with them, and then scale it up. And we also did things like a, an exchange program, for example, where uh, some of our like very first engineers uh, were traveling over to the US for for some time, like meeting with the people and just giving context. Um, about the uh, about the, uh, the the platform and the way how we are thinking uh, about engineering, and th that's also one thing which I personally I think I underestimated the importance of that at the beginning is um, we're, we we were like a very a very tight knit team so like a, basically everybody was friends with each other and uh, we have been working together in a very informal way for a very long time. Um, so basically, uh, if you would tell someone in the team some something, okay, like you have to, uh, we have to, we have to make this part of the software faster. We have to make this part of the software. We have to do it differently. Then, then almost everybody would end up with the same conclusions on how to do that. Now you bring in someone uh, who has like a very strong background in in engineering. You bring them into your company. You tell them the exact same question. Most certainly, they will end up with very different conclusions on how to do things, on, on where to where to do things, on how much that would cost, on how much time that would take. Um, so um, that I think was the was the uh, biggest challenge uh, there was to establish the accountability, to establish the trust, which I think is the basis for almost all work, uh, like not just within the company, but also um, between the employees, uh, and then to bring the context so that we can create alignment um, within the organization and have everybody run into the same direction yeah. um, without like just like micromanaging uh, yeah. every task, because then you don't need experienced I, people. I so. think in the process, your own role ended up changing as well, right? So yeah. you ended up hiring a chief engineering officer. Yes. D d tell us a bit how that went. Yeah, so so I mentioned that earlier, like when we when we started, um, like basically putting people who were individual contributors and kind of our best engineers into management roles, um, and I wouldn't say that I'm the best engineer in the company, but I I also went through this process of okay, like at the beginning it was the three of us, then we added some more people, but I was still like doing a lot of work on the actual technology. But eventually, our organization grew to a, to, to a size where I couldn't spend time anymore on thinking about the technology, but I had to spend a lot of time thinking about how do we structure, how do we hire, um, like basically what I would say from a, from a product standpoint or from a, from a technology standpoint are non-core topics. Um, and um, so that came to the point where it was very hard for me to, to actually drive the technology direction of the company. Um, and uh, we figured out that uh, it's probably not the best use of my time. Um, so I did this, um, I wouldn't say like step down or like I basically just stepped out of the management uh, uh, job and uh, went into a uh, an IC role essentially uh, with uh, I have some people who are supporting me but uh, I don't manage a large organization anymore and that just increased I think my efficiency and my impact I could have like for the company and for the uh, and also for our customers um, a lot and then we we hired uh, Faish, a lady uh, who is now running our engineering uh, 
organization, um, and she's doing a fantastic job uh, in in that. So she's uh, she introduced uh, very good accountability structures, uh, very structured uh, system for how people get rewarded. Uh, we have a I think a very good system now for promotions, and she also managed to attract uh, some like really key people, uh, key engineers, key ICs. Uh, into the company, so she was also great help on on hiring uh, and and building the team uh, there. So, yeah, it's uh, I think overall just increased the, the the clarity we have in the organization, like who's doing what, um, and it just freed up a lot of um, uh, minds for working on on actual problems problem solving uh, as opposed to like just managing organization. A, 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 and the results speak for themselves, right? Because our product is arguably the industry leading yeah. product. It's scalable, it's, it's, um, it has massive stability and, and is really a leading, yeah. a leading product. Um, when we spoke a bit earlier today, you, you said you have a number of learnings from this journey that went all the way back from what was it, 2010? Yeah. So a 13-year journey about your learnings about how to run an organization and how to take an engineering and product organizationally global. Yeah. What, what, what are some of these learnings? Yeah. So 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 I think the first the first piece of advice uh, I have is if you're getting advice, then then think about if that advice is actually applicable for you uh, and like interpret it to to fit to your situation because I think every company is different um, and it has its own DNA and the worst thing you can do is compromise your DNA because you think that you have to do something someone else is also uh, is also doing um, and uh, yeah for us like talking about uh, bringing the engineering organization global like from our nucleus in, in Munich and from our uh, homegrown team um, I think the the uh, so there is there is a lot of things which uh, we have done right. There is uh, some things which I think if I would have known, uh, we we would have maybe done it differently. But in in hindsight, that's also always easy. So one one thing which is important is that like even even though you might have a distributed organization, it's still important to bring people together uh, on a regular basis in person. So. Um, we're doing that like when we're when we're doing like planning phases or when we're when we're doing um, yeah just for aligning strategy because you have so much like subtle context which is hard to transport like if you're not in the same time zone um, um, or if you're not uh, sitting in the same office even um, the the second thing uh, is that what what we have learned about like executing projects is um, it's very important for everybody to know about all the projects, but then executing the projects is much easier if you do it like locally. So um, um, we have uh, we have different areas where we are um, de de basically defining: is that something which we have to run globally because we need skills from from all parts of the organization? Is that something which we can run locally? And running local is always preferable because you don't have these time zone handovers, uh, you have a team which can kind of push itself much better. Um, so, so prefer running local uh, over running global projects. Um, then uh, one topic which we have covered already uh, a little bit in the conversations is um, make sure that you are creating uh, tracks for your key contributors, uh, which allow them to, to be successful, um, because they're very, very important assets for, for, the, um, uh, for the company. So if, um, uh, if you don't have people who, in the end, like, are actually designing the system and writing the code and, and doing this, then you can have the best management uh, you want. Like In the end, the product won't do anything, uh, anything meaningful. Um, yeah, and there was one uh, as well where you said new managers tend to think that they have to look out for their team yeah. and defend their team, but that's not always the way they should act. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so that was that was one. Um, I also think one thing which we which we learned along the way is that if you have someone like if you have engineering teams and then uh, one of these people is stepping up into a manager, they tend to. 
basically fight for their team. So they try to protect their team, try to protect their scope. Maybe to some extent they have a very strong attachment to the components which they have built. Um, but like for us, like switching from a uh, on-prem system to a, a cloud infrastructure to a cloud system uh, to a system which doesn't just do analytics, but it's also like driving automation um, to a system which incorporates like uh, AI components and so on and so forth. Like sometimes you just have to replace components, and you have to restructure and, and align the organization with this and. Uh, <coughs> And so I think managers, like the job of a manager is to drive the company strategy and to manage the company strategy into the teams, of course also helping the people to grow. But um, with these like internal, like promoting people from inside out, um, I think that sometimes led to uh, a situation where uh, they were just like protecting their work or their their baby, uh, so to say, uh, instead of like uh, doing what is uh, what is the most important thing from a, from a company strategy standpoint. Martin, this was incredibly fun, and I hope helpful. Uh, to talk about taking an engineering organization from one person to uh, to 650 people around the globe, and and we hope to many many more over time. So thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us this morning, and thank you for your attention. Yep, thank you for your attention.